Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Carolyn Burns, and um, I'm a cardiologist here with BCS, and I'm uh, going to be talking to you today about cholesterol, but a few uh, housekeeping things um, first. Um, I'm going to give the talk and then allow some uh, chance for some questions. So if you have a question, please use the chat box function and type in your question, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, and the other thing is, please keep your um, microphone muted uh, during the presentation uh, so we don't get any background noise. So, um, I am a cardiologist and I also have a special certification in lipidology. And um, I guess that's why I've been chosen to talk to you about cholesterol today. So first let's talk about why cholesterol is important. Well, you probably all know that heart disease is the number one killer of both men and women in the United States. And each year, more than a million Americans have heart attacks and more than a half a million people die from heart disease. Heart disease overall accounts for about a quarter of the total deaths. And we spend hundreds of billions of dollars each year dealing with heart disease. Given that high blood cholesterol is one of the major risk factors, in fact, you could argue it is the singular most significant risk factor for the development of heart disease. That's why it's important. So how does cholesterol cause heart disease? Well, very simply, when you have elevated cholesterol and also usually some inflammation, you develop um, plaque in your arteries. And this starts at a very early age with fatty streaks. And over time, as more and more uh, deposits are made in the wall of your arteries. Uh, there becomes an impingement on uh, blood flow. And um, if one of those plaques becomes unstable, it can rupture and cause an acute thrombosis, which leads to a heart attack. So you don't know you have high cholesterol unless you get it checked. And you don't know that this process is going on in your blood vessels often until it causes a problem. So it's important to know your numbers and um, seek attention uh, if you have any symptoms. So what impacts the cholesterol in your system? Well, there are some things that you can control such as your diet, your weight, and your physical activity. And there are a lot of risk factors that are out of your control, your age, your gender, and your genes, which is one of the most important. In addition, many people who have diabetes don't, aren't able to control that. Um, so these are the risk factors that can contribute to your level of cholesterol and how well it's managed. <clears throat> Well, why should we have cholesterol at all if it causes so much problems? Well, we need it. Our cell membranes are made up of lipids. Hormones are made from cholesterol. And your neurologic function also depends on a supply of cholesterol uh, in your system. And as we've just discussed, high levels can lead to coronary disease, strokes, and also peripheral arterial disease. Those three things together, we're gonna lump together as cardiovascular disease uh, from here on in. So let's spend a couple minutes talking about what cholesterol means, what our lipid numbers mean, um, because I think that's important. When you go get a lipid panel done, and someone says your LDL cholesterol is blank, what they're actually um, looking at is the amount of cholesterol, this is in the bottom middle section, 
the amount of cholesterol in your LDL particles. So it's not the measurement of the particles, it's just the measurement of the cholesterol that's being transported by those particles. And the same is true when we're measuring HDL as well. We're measuring the cholesterol in the particles, but not the particles themselves, which is why at some points you may have measured your particle numbers or an ApoB number, uh, which is an extra test, and that detects how many particles you have of the LDL. It's a little confusing, but it's actually uh, much more um, definitive to, to understand how many particles you have and how much cholesterol you have. And I think the other thing to remember when we talk about cholesterol is that these particles are all, all floating around in our, our bloodstream. And with enzyme help, those cholesterol um, molecules are traded back and forth as are the triglycerides. So at any one time, things are in flux. And uh, that's why when you get your LDL cholesterol measured, it is a measurement at that point in time. It's not that that is a static um, reading. It changes um, every second. I also wanna mention that the ApoB measurement um, that we, we detect and the LDL cholesterol that's measured is also measuring something called lipoprotein little a. And we won't have time to get into that much today, but that is an extra particle that gives extra risk for development of atherosclerosis. And we'll save that for another day. So here's just another way to look at it. On the top bar, the calculated LDL cholesterol, which is what most lipid panels report, is a combination of the actual LDL cholesterol plus the lipoprotein little a on the right, plus the intermediate density lipo, lipoprotein. And um, that's all in your calculated. If we look down to what um, your direct LDL measures, which is another test, and some, sometimes you may get that test done rather than the calculated one. It's only measuring the actual LDL and the LP little a. So I just wanted to, you to be familiar with what the terms mean when somebody talks to you about your LDL cholesterol versus a particle number. So elevated cholesterol is found in over half of all American adults and that's considered a total cholesterol greater than 200. If you have no underlying vascular disease, then the goal uh, for your numbers are listed there. Total cholesterol less than 200, HDL greater than 40, LDL less than 100, and triglycerides less than 150. And I would encourage you again to know your numbers. So why is cholesterol important? This graph shows some of the statin trials um, of L for LDL lowering. And what it exhibits is that the lower you get your LDL level, the lower your event rate. And this is a linear relationship. For every 1% reduction in LDL, you get a 2% reduction in the cardiovascular event rates. So it's very important for us when you have or are at risk for cardiovascular disease to get your LDL down because we know we're gonna lower your event rate. That's the event rate of a heart attack or a stroke or needing a stent uh, or peripheral arterial disease as well. So how do we affect the cholesterol level? Well, our guidelines tell us that we should always start with lifestyle modification. That means it's on you. That's not something we can do for you. 
That's not a pill we can give you to take, but that's something that you can do to improve your cholesterol and thereby reduce your risk. So the first thing is diet therapy. And in diet therapy, uh, just some basic uh, things to consider. I'm not a dietitian, but I uh, tell my patients to decrease their saturated fats significantly, to eat more omega-3 fats and monounsaturated fats such as olive oil, and monitor your intake, increase your fiber every day, and try to eat more of a plant-based diet. The other therapeutic lifestyle change is weight loss and also exercise. So in terms of exercise, we consider it the fourth modifiable risk factor for heart disease, meaning it's up there and it's on you. We know that over 40% of people age 55 or older are sedentary. They don't move enough. Our bodies were made to move. And so the American Heart Association and also the guidelines that, that we follow recommend a minimum, minimum of 150 minutes of exercise per week. And exercise can be as simple as a brisk walk outdoors, or you could do it indoors on a treadmill. Anything that gets your heart rate up, gets you breathing a little heavier, um, is gonna fulfill this um, recommendation, but you gotta do it. You gotta put your sneakers on and do it. So what about weight loss? Well, most of us know that weight loss is a really difficult thing to achieve, but we've got a problem in this country. 42% of the US population is considered obese and that's compared to 25% in 1980. And it's just been increasing every year. Being obese or overweight increases your risk, not only of having ele elevated cholesterol, but also hypertension, diabetes, stroke, cancer, arthritis. Um, it's very detrimental. And it is not an easy thing to, to deal with being overweight or obese but it too needs to be something that we pay attention to and attempt to improve if we're trying to treat uh, your cholesterol. So now I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about medications. Many of you on here probably have some problem with heart disease or you're interested in that. When you have diagnosed cardiovascular disease, we typically recommend that we reduce your cholesterol. Even if your cholesterol numbers don't look so terrible, if you come in with a symptomatic event like a heart attack or need a stent, we know that the amount of cholesterol in your system is too high. So in addition to your lifestyle modifications, we will likely recommend a medication to lower your cholesterol. And top of the list are the statins. Uh, I'm gonna go through each of these individually, but the statins, uh, the top three, three uh, medications um, groups here on the list, we've had around for more than 30 years. So we have a lot of data on those. Um, the others lower on the list are newer, and I'm gonna go over those briefly as well. So the statins. The first statin <clears throat> was lovastatin, and it was approved in 1987. And the rest of the statins came after that, the last one in about 2003, that was rosuvastatin. These statins have been used widely. We have studied them intensively and we have shown that they reduce the risk of heart attacks and strokes um, consistently. Statins have um, our first line therapy 
in patients who have elevated cholesterol and cardiovascular disease because we have so much data and we know that they provide um, uh, good results. But not everybody can tolerate a statin. There are a lot of um, patients out there who feel that they have muscular discomfort or cramping when they're on a statin. And quite um, honestly, it's probably less than um, one would think. Most people can find a statin at some dose that they can tolerate. And I will um, try people on many different statins because they all vary in terms of their mechanism uh, of action and their um, makeup so that people may tolerate one and not another. So I will make patients try a statin because they're very important to be on. Um, and uh, I would uh, say that most of the time we can find, find a statin that works for you. There are uh, varying degrees of lowering on these statin medications. Um, the, the ones that lower uh, the cholesterol the most would be the Crestor and Livolo or Resuvastatin and Patavastatin. Those are the most efficacious, um, but sometimes we have to use one not so efficacious um, if those aren't tolerated. Also, uh, the Livolo or Patavastatin is not available as a generic yet but all the rest of them are, and they are all now quite affordable. Um, so they are the mainstay, and likely if you have elevated cholesterol or have some type of cardiovascular disease, these are the medications uh, you would be started on. The bile acid binders are um, relatively uh, old group of medications. Uh, they were out uh, before the statins were were uh, sort of discovered. Um, some of them come as powders, some as pills. They tend to cause um, GI side effects and their primary uh, role is in decreasing the LDL. Um, and we still use these sometimes in people who can't tolerate statins or who need additional uh, lowering even on a statin. So you may find those. The one used most commonly now is probably uh, Wellcall or Colacevalam. Um, there's also the uh, fibric acids. There's a number of these as well. Um, and they are primarily used for those who have high triglycerides. Um, and uh, they don't do much uh, for LDL and they uh, often also have to be used carefully in combination with statins due to some uh, interactions. So they're principally used if you have very high triglycerides um, and we're concerned about uh, the possibility of pancreatitis or something like that from high triglycerides. The cholesterol absorption inhibitors primarily is azetamibe or Zetia, uh, which has been shown to improve outcomes as well, just like with the statin drugs. Uh, it decreases the cholesterol absorption uh, that you get from food. Um, so it's often combined with a statin to decrease the overall um, uh, cholesterol, LDL, et cetera. And um, common side effects are list, listed there, although um, they don't occur to, to a very great degree. And uh, Zetamibe is now generic. Um, so that makes that very affordable as well to use in combination if, if needed. Um, then we're gonna talk about the fish oils for a minute. So fish oils um, have also been shown to reduce triglycerides. 
And um, we have two uh, prescription drugs that we currently use to decrease um, triglycerides, Loveza and Vesipa. Um, and generally these were approved just for people with triglycerides over 500, again, to reduce pancreatitis. Um, however, a uh, little over a year ago, uh, there was a major study released looking at Vesipa, which is a specific type of uh, fish oil. It's an EPA only fish oil. And what they showed is that either in people who had cardiovascular disease or people who had diabetes, it significantly reduced their risk of cardiac death, stroke, MI, or heart attack. And so this drug has been given approval to treat people who have cardiovascular disease, whose triglycerides are only mildly elevated, um, about above 150. Uh, so that the use of this Vesipa is gonna be much greater from here on out because it has this expanded indication um, with really excellent outcomes data. Um, many of you may be taking fish oil that you're buying over the counter uh, without a prescription. And all of those vary in the amount of fish oil they have in them. Um, they might be inexpensive, um, but we don't have any definite benefit or outcome data from these. And knowing how much um, of the omega-3s are in these supplements, um, it's unlikely that if you're taking one or two of these, that it's doing much at all. Uh, in order to reach the amount of omega-3s that's in the prescription strength fish oil, you'd have to be taking upwards of 12 to 15 of those tablets, depending upon uh, the amount of omega-3s in them. And uh, I'm, I don't know of anybody who wants to take 12 or 15 uh, tablets uh, a day. So if, if you need an omega-3, uh, it's probably best that you are on a prescription strength. We know what you're getting and we know what the benefit is. Um, and now that we have outcomes data for the Vesipa, it's um, pretty hard not to um, go, go with what's proven. And not just with what's least expensive. So that brings me to one of the more recent drugs, uh, or there's two of them in this category, PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, I don't know how much you've heard about these, but they've been approved for over five years. Um, they are injectable monoclonal antibodies that decrease your LDL by upwards of 50 to 60%. So that's a huge decrease. Um, they're called Preluent and Repatha, and they are typically injected every two weeks with very low side effects. They are definitely more expensive than the other agents. And they're indicated in two specific um, patients those who have really severe elevations in LDL greater than 190, which typically means you have a genetic form of uh, high cholesterol called familial hypercholesterolemia. It's also indicated in those with um, cardiovascular disease whose LDL remains above goal after we've treated them with uh, statin and or Zetia. Um, the PCSK9 inhibitors basically help recycle the LDL receptor on the surface of the liver so that we can clear the LDL out of the bloodstream. It's a little complicated. Um, we don't need to go into that, but they work well and they were studied with patients already on statins. Um, so most of the time, this is an added medication, um, and these drugs have 
both been tested in studies and shown to reduce by about 15% the risk of heart attack or having a stent put in or having a stroke. Um, so significant reduction in events on these medications when they're added to a statin. Um, they are uh, getting used more and more as we're getting more and more aggressive with our LDL lowering. And now is a good time just to talk about the goal of where we want your LDL to be. Um, as we mentioned, if you don't have any vascular disease, an LDL of 100 um, is very acceptable. If you have been diagnosed with vascular disease, then we really would like to see your LDL less than 70. And if you can't get to less than 70, then our guidelines say we should add additional drugs. So these are one of the additional drugs we have to add to the statins uh, to help lower your numbers. In Europe, they recommend that you get your LDL down as low as 40 if you've had multiple events. So you can see that sometimes it's gonna take a couple of medications depending on where you start to get your numbers to goal. Um, there is going to be likely another PCSK9 inhibitor uh, approved in the near future. That is if the COVID vaccines aren't taking up the FDA's time and attention. But um, it is an injectable drug, but it's only given twice a year and most likely will be given in the doctor's office or in a pharmacy. Uh, so that will be um, sort of a different paradigm, but it will do the same action that these two agents do. And the last drug that was just approved earlier this year is called Nexlitol. It's recently been approved for mostly for those who have statin intolerance. So patients can tolerate statins or they can only tolerate a very low dose. This is a pill that um, can be used to add on to the statin plus or minus also azetamide to get your numbers to goal. And it's indicated for those who have vascular disease or are at very high risk due to their high cholesterol. This medication works in the liver in the same pathway that the statins do, but it's not activated in the muscles. And therefore it has little to no muscle issues like statins might, but it does in some who have had gout or who have elevated uric acid increase the risk of having gout. So that's one thing to consider before you go to uh, this agent. And it's listed here as Nexlitol and Nexlazet. The Nexlazet is a combo pill of Nexlitol plus Zetia. Since those are both non-statin drugs, they work well together in those who are statin intolerant. So some of you who've had difficulties with statin may, may see this drug um, in the future. So in summary, I wanna just express that cholesterol is the most important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And you don't know if it's elevated unless you have it tested. And not only that, if you're put on a medication, we don't know if we've reached our goal unless you get tested again. So it's important to keep track of your numbers and to know what kind of results you're getting. But even more important is what you can do to modify your lifestyle to help us get your numbers to goal. It's really important. We can't have somebody sitting on the couch eating potato chips while we're trying to get their uh, cholesterol down, we need you active and we need you eating a good healthy diet. 
you should always discuss what the goal of your treatment of cholesterol is with your doctor. Know what the goal is and work together to get your numbers to your goal. It will reduce your event rate. There are many medications now available for treatment. Statins are always gonna be the first line therapy. And depending upon how dogged your doctor is, you may try many before they give up. Um, I think that uh, it's a good idea for you to always consider uh, trying medications, even though you may hear from friends or relatives that this medication caused this side effect. Everybody reacts differently and everybody um, has a different uh, milieu in their system. So you never know how you're gonna be affected unless you try it. The good thing about these side effects from the medications are that they go away if you stop the medication. So it's not like it's a long lasting effect. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Uh, we will take some time for questions and um, please feel free to use the chat button. And um, let's see what's in here. Okay, so how often should you have lab work? Um, in general, that depends. If you're starting a drug for the first time, it's always good to have a follow-up to see where you've gotten. And depending upon the drug, it, that may be in anywhere from one to three or four months um, to see the full effect of the, of the drug. If you have reached uh, your goal, then I recommend that you check your blood levels twice a year. That's to make sure, I, I would make sure that you're taking your medication and that something else hasn't derailed uh, your results. So if you're adjusting medications, you're gonna be tested more often than that. And it really depends on what you're adding and what you're following as to how quickly we can see the results. Um, how do the medications affect blood sugar? So, um, Basically, the statins are the drugs that can actually raise your blood sugar a little bit. Typically, that's anywhere from five to eight uh, points. And um, in general, uh, the, the feeling in the medical world is that if you are that close to being um, a borderline diabetic or pre-diabetic, then the benefits of being on the statin far outweigh the risk of the mild elevation in your uh, glucose levels. So um, if you're that close, you likely need the statin a lot more than you need to worry about those few points. <clears throat> what are some common high cholesterol foods to avoid? That's... Uh, the high cholesterol foods to avoid? Well, in general, we're looking at fat. Um, and as you, if you followed the um, recommendations from the American Heart Association for the last 30 years, you'll realize that there's been some waffling about the actual intake of cholesterol. Um, uh, so, you know, the question is whether you should eat eggs or you shouldn't eat eggs, or if you should eat eggs, do you only eat the egg white? Um, and in general, it's felt that the fats are more important than the cholesterol. So that's why we focus on decreasing the saturated fats. Um, and not to worry as much about the cholesterol, not that we want you to have you know, two eggs every day of the week. Um, but uh, the jury's still out 
on the egg situation. Um, it's important also to remember that when the Heart Association was pushing a very low fat diet, uh, that's when the food manufacturers responded with um, low, low fat, but high sugar processed foods. And guess what happens when you intake a lot of uh, sugar? It turns into fat. So both things are important and a balanced diet is the best. Somebody has asked if um, being, being on a vegan diet uh, is a good idea. <laughs> um, yes, if you can do it, um, a plant-based diet is very good. Um, unfortunately, I think it's pretty hard for people who've grown up for 30, 50 years uh, on a different diet to switch. Um, but I encourage uh, my patients to eat more plant-based um, and avoid the, the sugar processed foods. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the question is, if you're on the same drug for years and years, does it ever decrease in um, efficacy? And there may be a slight decrease and that's sort of um, the body's mechanism of trying to uh, adapt. So if you're on a statin, it seems like you have a good response for a couple of years and it may be even less, and then it's a little less efficacious that may be the body's uh, response and actual an increase in absorption of cholesterol um, may be occurring because you're um, reducing your cholesterol manufacturing with the statins. And so your body's reacting by trying to absorb more, which is why adding Zetia to the statins is a very powerful combination. But there, is, there can be a little bit of a slide back after being on the statins for a while. With the newer drug, those um, injectable PCSK9 inhibitors, I have not seen that. Um, patients tend to have a very stable reduction in their uh, cholesterol on that medication. Um, Okay. So somebody's asking a question about LP little a, and um, we could spend a whole hour talking about that. So LP little a is genetically determined, and um, it actually can be measured at as young as age two to determine whether you have it or not. Um, but it is a very strong risk factor, not only for the development of atherosclerosis or blockages, but also uh, potentially important in aortic stenosis. And that's aortic stenosis that's progressive, not what we would consider senile aortic stenosis. And aortic stenosis, um, it means that your aortic valve gets thickened and then calcified and doesn't open well. So this LP little a is a risk factor in the development of that as well as uh, blockages in your arteries. And part of the reason why people haven't talked about LP little a much is because we really haven't had any good way to treat it, but there is now a medication in phase three trials uh, that reduces the LP little a significantly. And so we may have a way to treat it and that means we should really be looking for it uh, in the future. Um, let's see. Yeah. Someone said they lost voice connection. 
Sorry, it will be recorded. Um, how does CoQ10 play into this? So uh, the statins <clears throat> decrease the production of ubiquinol, which is basically what CoQ10 is. And for some people, it's felt that that reduction in ubiquinol is part of the reason you get the muscle aching. So CoQ10 may improve that and allow you to stay on a statin um, by taking CoQ10 as well as the statin. For others, it may not make much of a difference. Um, I personally don't recommend that everybody on a statin take CoQ10, but if they're having difficulty with a statin, then I might suggest they try it, see if it helps. Can I, can I explain APOE? Okay, we have somebody who's, who's um, on this. So um, APOE is part of the LDL receptor and it has several different genetic, um, uh, what shall I say, variations um, measured one through four, APOE, Three, you have you have two of these, one from each um, side of the family. APOE um, three three is the most common, and um, is not necessarily associated with any adverse um, outcomes. APOE two may uh, be associated with an increased risk for diabetes. And APOE4 is uh, associated with uh, possibility of dementia. So these are sometimes tested. Uh, it's done during advanced lipid testing in some cases, but has to be ordered specifically to look at this. Um, it occasionally helps us decide what might be best to help you lower your cholesterol. Um, and uh, because it's genetically determined, you only need to get that checked one time to know what your two alleles are or what your two genetic uh, determined um, levels are or numbers are. And uh, the problem is that uh, some people may want to know <laughs> whether they have certain risks and other people may not want to know. At this point, we don't have any good data to know how best to treat um, these variations in the APOE, um, but uh, things are being looked at. Um, a specific type of, uh, of the omega-3 fish oils, uh, the DHA may be beneficial in those who have APOE4. Um, so, that's a very exciting sort of area of investigation at this point. Um, and I think that's, that's about the, the sum up of, the, of that. Um, okay, so time of day to take a statin. It really depends on the statin. Um, the shorter acting the statin, um, the more it's recommended to be taken at bedtime. And that's because it seems to have a better effect on the liver uh, over the course of the night. Uh, so drugs like simvastatin and pravastatin prav should be taken definitely at nighttime. But drugs like rosuvastatin and atorvastatin, they're very long acting. So they can be taken any time of day. Um, I, in general, just, tell people to take them at night just, just so it's consistent and not you know, confusing, but honestly, it really depends on the drugs. Okay. Um, what is the liability risk factor for the injection drugs? Um, and how often do you have to do blood work after being injected? 
So the, I'm not quite sure what the liability risk factor is for the, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at about that. I can tell you that they're extremely well tolerated. I probably have less complaints on those drugs than I do on statin drugs, um, which seems surprising since it's an injection. Um, but there are a few people who have not been able to take it um, due to an allergic reaction or a side effect. And that could be anything from back pain to feeling like you have the flu or something like that. Um, those are very limited and again, go away if you stop the medication. Um, blood testing is about the same, although you can see the results from these injectables within a couple of days and you could check a level after the first, one week after the first dose and get a good idea about how effective they are. And then a few times a year, again, is, is needed to make sure that they're taking the medication correctly, um, they're administering it correctly, et cetera. Um, um, can I say something about fatty liver disease? Um, so fatty liver disease is uh, sometimes uh, associated with metabolic syndrome where you have high triglycerides and low HDL. Um, you tend to have abdominal um, uh, fat as well uh, and diabetes. And it is um, usually diagnosed by ultrasound um, and typically responds well to uh, change in diet and also um, um, weight loss. Um, and there are families that are more prone to this than others. Um, okay, maybe we call that it. Um, thank, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, I hope you learned something today and um, We'll, we'll mail out the recording uh, for you to uh, listen again or um, um, uh, cause you to ask some questions of your doctors the next time you see them. Take care, be well.